Welcome everybody. And um, yes, we will record the session. Welcome to the fifth event of the speaker series, Social Policy Unpacked, Exploring Pathways for Green and Digital Transitions. It's a speaker series co-organized by DG Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion and the Zoe Institute for Future Fit Economies. And it's funded under the Horizon Europe program. My name is Christoph Gran. I'm co-founder of the Zoe Institute and senior policy consultant. Zoe is a think and do tank working at the interface of science and policy, and we're specialized in co-creating yeah, policy and also bringing new economic thinking to policy. And with this speaker series, we would invite everybody, the public, policymakers, wherever you work, to think outside the box and, and inspire yourself, be inspired with new ideas, and to make sure that the transition to yeah, zero emissions, to a green and social economy, uh, within planetary boundaries is going to be success successful. We have 12 events, so we're almost at half. We started in December and it will run until June 23. Um, following this event, event, we will have another one in two weeks, 19th of April, on home ownership, renting and society with Professor Sebastian Kohl from Berlin. There will be more events to come Follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. You will get emails uh, with the next events if you're recorded for the, uh, registered for this event. And yeah, you can check out the recordings of the past events on our homepage, and you will also find the presentations there. The structure is as follows. We will start with roughly 30 minutes, 35 minutes of presentation from the speaker, followed by Q&A. Um, together with Nadia from the hosting unit F3 at DG Employment. You can already see here the link to the Slido where you can yeah, bring in your questions and vote, thumbs up, thumbs down, or not only thumbs up, I think, for the questions. And yeah, please be part of it. Ask questions. You can also put them in the chat if you have difficulties with Slido. We already saw in the last events on, on regional divides that it is very important to put social policy at, at the heart of the Green Deal, that cohesion is the cornerstone of a successful transformation. But the focus on, on the industrial policy, on, on the topic we had last time, it already showed that you need a good plan and you need evidence-based policy to, to, to perform well. But what happens if society leaves that ground of evidence-based decisions and moves into fake news, populist solutions, et cetera, et cetera. Something that is not new to us. And I'm very happy today that we have Professor Vivian Schmidt with us. She's a Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration, Professor of International Relations and Political Science at the Boston University, and the founding director of BU's Center for the Study of Europe. She also received the French uh, Legion of Honor in 2018, and not as big as that, but she's also a new economic senior fellow at Zoe. And um, her latest book, Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone. You can take a look uh, in, in the chat and, and, and check out this very interesting book, and she will continue studying of course, the role of populism, and therefore she received the Guggenheim Fellowship. Her research focuses on democracy, on the challenges of populism, on European politi political economy and institutions, and on ideas and discourses in political analysis. Vivian, I'm very grateful and honored to have you here, and please, the, the stage is yours. We are very interested in what you will tell us in the next 30, 35 minutes, please. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and what I'm going to do is share my screen. Um, so just give me one second here. There we go. There we go. So I'm going to be talking about how you overcome the populist, chall populist challenges to social co cohesion. But of course, before I talk about how we overcome them, we need to figure out what they are. So 
in my research lately, I've been thinking about how do you get into populism because there's so much about populism, so much literature every day. There's another book or five or 20 plus articles. And so I thought the best way in is actually to take what they say seriously and how they say it. So what we're going to, we're going to be looking at rather quickly, um, the message in terms of style. And so these are the four Ms of populism, the message, style, and content, the messenger in terms of leaders and follow, followers, the medium, social media and traditional media, and the milieu, the economic, social, political sources of discontent, and then importantly, what happens as they capture power, where they are, what they say, and what they do when they're on the outside, then what happens when they get into government? Do they compromise or do they remain highly uh, antagonistic? And then what they do in government. Um, and finally, how do we overcome the populist challenges? And I'm going to be talking about generally and also by the EU. And as we go forward, I'll try to give you examples that focus on the social cohesion issues, as well as in particular climate. Um, but sometimes it comes in directly and sometimes it's simply a function of um, my discussion of other aspects. So if we start with the message first, and I think this is probably the most important thing to take home about discourse, about populism, it's got the same political style of discourse. This is an us versus them style. It's anti-liberal democracy. Some people call this a strong ideology. That's Pierre-Jean Vallon, a French philosopher and sociologist, because it's about ideas about how democracy should work which is without intermediaries. It's basically us versus them and we decide. So it's about um, a discourse that blames corrupt elites, discredits experts. Um, and all, most of the time, but not always, there's also as part of this, a post-truth politics of bullshit, lies, fake news, and it's about breaking taboos, it's about uncivil lang language, and tremendously important to see, and I've been interviewing any number of so-called populists, there's a similar kind of, it's the elites, whether they're on the left or on the right, whether the populists are on the left or the right, it's a them phenomenon. We've been marginalized. We want to take back control. We don't like them. So it's a style of discourse. But of course, there's significant content. And that's where you get tremendous differentiation. For the extremes on the right, and I'm going to be going into some more detail on this content later, but for the extremes on the right, it's about ex it's exclusionary. It's about identity politics and mainly culture, although economics also comes in. And here the big question about the right is, does it lead to illiberal democracy or even an authoritarian drift? If we think about the case of Hungary in particular, but also Poland, there are big concerns about the authoritarian drift. Um, there are also concerns elsewhere, but that's where we've seen it in particular. And then in terms of the content of the discourse, the extremes on the left are very different. They tend to be much more inclusive and universalist. And here it's much more focused on the economics and class, although culture and identity also can come in. And here for the extremes on the left, there's more of a question about will they revive democracy or will they also um, engage in an illiberal drift? And I think what we've seen by experience is that the extremes on the, on the right have tended to move much more in Europe have tended much more to have an illiberal drift, uh, even toward authoritarianism, in contrast to the extremes on the left, whether we talk about Syriza or the Five Star Movement, which, you know, what is it is another question. Um, but also elsewhere, um, it's much more they give up, they respect electoral politics and they give up and become more of a loyal opposition. We also see this in, in other parts of Southern uh, Europe. Of course, we don't want to say this is always the case because all you have to do is look at Latin America and the extreme left has, has been very bad in terms of an authoritarian drift. So there's no necessary um, movement um, in any direction, but it's important to recognize that 
for the message, style of discourse is universal, content can be very different. Um, but importantly, the message is tremendously important uh, because it helps shape the narrative and bend the truth. And this is about building a base, building support. Uh, and if you want to talk about how does the how do populists set the agenda, it begins by the discourse, by the message. Um, but then what about the messenger? And of course, there's as much attention to this as anything else. Um, the leaders um, tend to be charismatic. Um, authenticity is about, you know, talking in simple language. Uh, Trump is probably our best example of this, incomplete sentences um, that create a sense of intimacy because people think, oh, well, I can complete his sentences for him. But these, all of these leaders essentially claim to embody the people. They speak for the people. And this is, again, about no intermediation between the leader and the people. And that's why you have a tendency to dis, uh, for populists to um, not respect representative institutions, for not wanting an independent judiciary and the rest and a free media, because that interferes with their sense that they are speaking for the people, the real people, the majority, even though this is often a minority, et cetera. And of course, you can't just focus on the leaders, as many do. It's also about very much about the followers. And here, important to pay attention to the intellectual advisors. Donald Trump had Steve Bannon, Marine Le Pen had uh, Philippon until the disastrous 2017 debate where she said they were leaving the euro and Macron basically wiped the floor with her and she then got rid of him and got other advisors. But you can see this with Beppe Grillo and, and um, Gian, Gian Roberto Casaleggio. There's always an intellectual advisor. And I think that's important if you wanna get a sense of where they're going. Um, but also, and this is very important, activist networks of support. It's not that they're on their own. And it's important to see, and we'll see that with the social media as well, about how they spread their message. It's about these networks that are often very much under the radar for a very long time until, you know, until you get populist parties breaking into, um, into government in some way or another. But okay, but so here, back to the content, how is it that they frame the debate to captivate the people? And here again, here, extreme right, it's anti-immigration, it's generally nationalist. On the EU, we want another EU. For a very long time, it was Brexit, um, uh, Frexit or Swexit or whatever, but once Brexit happened, what you saw was sort of a shift to another EU as opposed to leaving the EU or the Euro. But here often, and, and I think this is important, especially if we, if we consider the trajectory, um, often the economics, especially when you're part of the Euro, there's much, there's little leeway, and yet what the extreme right often does is frames the frame the debate then about not just identity issues, but the social cohesion issues, anti-LBGTQ, anti-abortion, and also welfare chauvinism. It used to be that the left supported the welfare state, but then they seem to abandon it with this sort of center-right, center-left mainstream parties all agreeing to austerity and structural reform in the decade of the Eurozone crisis. And the result is they left an opening to the extremes on the right in particular, also on the left, with were for, they're the ones who now say, we support, um, we support the welfare state, but just for us. And so I think this is, this is also important for social policy because how do you have co cohesion when they're really saying we're only going to do this for one part? And obviously this is very much anti-immigration. It's about identity politics. I, saw, I just saw Eric Zemmour um, on uh, CNews, the French program this morning, and it's all identity. And it's about anti-immigration. We see this a lot. 
But then, and I think the really interesting piece is climate and climate skepticism. Because here, rather than being a we hate, you know, we hate them all, which is the anti-migration thing, um, this is this is, you know, been basically one piece of the discourse in recent years, very interestingly, is end of the month versus end of the world. You heard that with the yellow vests protests, but you hear it basically taken up in particular about the by the extreme right. And it's a very, you know, it's it's a very successful argument. You know, we can't make ends meet. And yet you talk to us about the end of the world. Um, what you often see is that this is about NIMBY, not in my backyard, when they're talking about climate. Um, so it's scenic nationalism or resources nationalism. Um, and often, certainly we see that in the US, it's climate denial. Or in Poland, you get a focus on, well, it's about our industry, we can't afford this. Uh, it's jobs, jobs, jobs. And you're actually seeing some of this elsewhere as well. Um, uh, certainly in other parts of Central and Eastern Europe, but even in Western Europe in recent time. Um, there's also the EU side is really interesting because of course here, this is about targeting the EU as technocratic. The EU is making us do this. The Europe fit for 55 is not fit for us. And this is about defending freedom. Um, but okay, but there are tremendous differences amongst countries in terms of how the extreme right deals with this. Um, but it's generally protecting national sovereignty, personal freedom, and seeing the other side, again, this is about the Manichaean, us versus them, green totalitarianism is a word that we see a lot. Okay, but what about the extreme left? Here, this is a different focus. It's anti-globalization, but in a different way from the extreme right. Um, it's more universalist. They too want another EU, but one that's much more truly democratic in their view, and also redistributive. They're anti-austerity, pro-human rights, and for the climate, they're very much want regulation. They want this to go faster. There's another part of the extreme left where we can talk about extremist social movements. You saw this in France last week um, in terms of acti activism and violence. But I think we have to bracket the social movements because that's not the same phenomenon we're really talking about in terms of populism and populist parties, even though they can sometimes feed into them. But social movements can be a very different phenomenon. So I just want to um, bracket them. But for the left, it's their stroke, uh, pro, strong pro, pro climate, but it's about making the rich pay um, and corporate and, and basically in making the corporations pay via global taxation, or at least national taxation um, as well. And then, of course, I've just already mentioned um, before, this is the extreme left and the extreme right go from anti-EU to another EU after Brexit. So that's the messenger. And I spent a lot of time on that. So I'm going to go more quickly through the rest. Um, so it's important and here one should not forget social media have given the rise to contemporary populism. In the past, you had, you know, if you think about the 1930s, the radio was the new media and new technology, but that was still controlled by the center. You had to get elected. You had to gain control in order to control the media, i.e. the radio. But now the social media decenter democracy. Anyone can get in there. And importantly, it's the populists who used it first. Jean-Marie Le Pen did it back in the 1980s with the Minitel. Um, but Podemos not being able to be heard in the national media for a very long time essentially created support, activist networks of support through social media. Echo chambers, Grillo, Beppe Grillo, the same thing. Matteo Salvini, really clever with his band of 20 somethings, um, uh, testing the mood every day. And then a migrant washes, I'm exaggerating here, but a migrant washes up on shore and he's seen cuddling a cute little kitten. 
So very much, you know, curating their messages. And of course, the Facebook algorithms pointed to increased the anger, anger um, uh, from the messages. So it naturally pushed them. Um, the populist messaging, creating echo chambers of support. Um, and, you know, you see YouTube, blogs, and Twitter, same sort of thing. And this creates basically virtual networks of dissent. They begin nationally in national languages, but they quickly spread transnationally. Just think about um, Stephen Bannon when he loses um, favor with Trump comes to Europe to try to create a European network and European foundation of the extreme right. He fails, but still important to recognize. And then, but beyond the social media, traditional media are equally important to amplify the social media messaging. Tweets become the stories of the day and it becomes an amplification. Um, and so that it, it essentially, Mainstream politicians also, what do they do? They also respond to the tweets. Fake news. They say this is fake news, but then they also. So it becomes almost the decentering of democracy is also decentering the message. Ultimately, mainstream politicians tend not to be heard. The media focus is also to blame. It becomes about leaders' personality. Increasingly, news becomes entertainment. And it's much more entertaining to talk, you know, to, to focus on what populist tweet than to look at the kind of the, what was the word? The evidence-based evidence society and the kinds of messages um, that you get from there. But also importantly, the media, the traditional media have increasingly be owned, have been become increasingly owned by the powerful. In or Orban basically had his or oligarchs uh, buy up any independent news stations and basically bled them dry in terms of, of, of advertising revenue before so that they could be picked off and put in a, in a foundation so that in Hungary, there is no independent news now, no free media. Um, Rupert Murdoch's, Murdoch owns this, the Fox News and The Sun. Again, um, uh, this is highly problematic in Vincent Bolloré's C News, which I mentioned earlier. Again, so you see that the ownership has actually become a very important piece of this. There used to be media regulations that didn't allow a kind of monopolistic control. But that's, you know, gone, you know, gone by the by, basically because of neoliberal policies that sought to deregulate um, uh, good intentions, but ultimately we find ourselves here. And of course, new technology platforms, et cetera, become very difficult and they're the ones who police themselves or rather don't. Okay, and then the milieu. And now many of you will be saying, but wait a minute, wait a minute. You're all talking, most political scientists, economists, et cetera, focus on the milieu. This is the sort of the sources, the socioeconomic, sociocultural, and political sources of discontent. So if we focus on the socioeconomics, this is people feeling left behind. These are the losers from globalization. Um, these are people in rural and semi and peri-urban communities who feel left behind because they don't get the kinds of services. They're not the kinds of jobs they had in the past. And of course, what we see also with the socio socioeconomics, this is Piketty, the rise of inequality, the 1% at the same time that you get increasing poverty. Uh, we wages didn't increase from the 1980s on, even though there might have appeared to be increases because commodity prices went down, mainly because things were offshore to China. I mean, all of this for the people feeling left behind, but even those, it's actually not just the people who are the poorest, but rather it's people, it's wealthier people comparatively in places that, that worry that, you know, their kids are not going to find jobs or they themselves have lost the good manufacturing jobs in the past. So this is also sociocultural about worries about loss of status, 
But beyond this, then, worried about loss of status to whom? Here's when populist discourses come in and they create the fear of the other, the enemy. It's the migrants. It's also concerns about changing faces of the nation. It's about white working class males, for the most part, who feel that they've really lost out. So this is the socioeconomics and the sociocultural, but we should not forget the, the political. There's a feeling of loss of trust and control. The Brexit slogan, take back control, is really about the politics. But also, it's about, actually, we can't just say it's all about populism. It's also about the mainstream. The politicians and the institutions seem increasingly remote. It's about technocratic depoliticization as well. And of course, mainstream parties seem to fail, to fail to be responsive to concerns. Um, and the, also the mainstream parties have been hollowed out as party structure. It used to be on the right, you had all these various Christian associations, intermediary associations. On the left, there were the trade unions and other um, political organizations that created deep roots for the political parties, they've lost that. At the same time, it's kind of neoliberal policies that have given more and more um, um, power and competences to, um, to, uh, to technocrats. I think that's a DG employee, but also at the national level. And there are good reasons, obviously, for all of this, but there's a feeling on the part of the populace that no one's responding. In my book, Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone, I really talk about the loss of legitimacy and the concerns that have to do not only with the output legitimacy, i.e. basically feeling that... Um, uh, the ec economics weren't working, and this was not just in, in Southern Europe under programs, but also in Northern Europe. Um, but it wasn't just about that, but it was also that a lack, feeling that there was a lack of responsiveness as both the center left and the center right continued to do policies that were basically the same. And what you, and that, that's where you see the explosion of populism, basically on the right and the left. Um, and here we get the crises, the Eurozone crisis, but that's, if that were not enough, the refugee crisis, Brexit. So no time to talk about COVID, but here it's important to know this was a different kind of crisis. Could we say that it was a better kind of crisis? No, we don't want to say that. It was a terrible crisis. But that is a moment when you did get responsiveness from politicians. You got the Resilience and Recovery Fund. You got a whole range of attempts to actually shore up um, income because of the crisis, all of that made a tremendous difference. Ukraine is another crisis. No time to talk about that here. But then finally, um, to talk about uh, still sort of the last real slide on populism is what happens when they capture power. So when populist on the outside, this is about shaping the narrative and framing the debate. This is really the Manichaean us versus them. Um, uh, Beppe Grillo's, we're going to open open the parliament like a can of tuna fish. Uh, we're going to leave the euro, says Marine Le Pen. We're going to leave the euro, say the Sweden Democrats on the extreme right. But the extreme left also says the same thing. As we saw by 2018, they're not saying this anymore. But that's when they're on the outside. They can say anything. But they also don't know much for those at least on the extremes of the left are coming out of social movements. On the right, they do. And what we see with populists on the right, um, on the extreme right in particular is, and that's not in, in what I've just said here yet, but there's a kind of normalization, banalisation for Marine Le Pen, so that in 2010, she talks about Muslims taking over the street with reference to the Nazis, which is a highly um, extreme kind of expression, by 2013, she's saying, no, 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 this is about tolerance. And they, the Muslims, are intolerant. And you get that in the Netherlands as well. And this is Pim Fortein already back in the 2000s. You know, we want to be intolerant of the intolerant in order to maintain our tolerant nation. So what you get is a very different thing. They're not multicultural. 
So that's the extremes on the right. And on the extremes on the left, they were mostly not, you know, um, they mostly came from social movements. So they actually had a lot more to learn. Extremes on the right who came from hardcore right parties slowly changed the message because they wanted to be part of power. Once they get on the inside into parliament, there's a learning process that happens. But as that happens, as they get into the power, and this is where policy agenda setting is important, they push the mainstream to reset their agendas because mainstream parties in particular on the center right, but also on the center left, actually hear that message. There's the pull, there's the push, because we're losing our, our electorate, but there's the pull of the power of attraction of the message. So on the center left, we can talk about the extremes on the left in Portugal and Spain becoming part of coalitions and pulling the party a bit farther to the left, and the and but even the center left listens to the sirens of the populace. So François Hollande, um, you know, gets rid of double wants to get rid of double citizenship for terrorists. Um, a doesn't it doesn't happen because it's the socialists themselves who say, wait, what are you doing? But in Denmark, it's the center left most recently that basically took on the extreme right anti migration. Um, uh, uh, agenda, uh, and then one, and the and the People's Party basically crashed and burned. But the real problem is actually the center right that has been moving much much farther to the right, picking up on that agenda for uh, because they're worried that they're going to lose their um, their electorate, but also because they see that that resonates. Highly problematic, and I've just listed some of the some of the um, mainstream parties that have moved over because of that. Um, but what about populist in government? Here, you don't know until they get in government. They may compromise. They may change their core ideas. That's certainly Tsipras in um, in in Greece and Di Luigi Di Maio in um, uh, in Italy, uh, the Five Star, but. They may not compromise and may therefore undermine the institutions of liberal democracy. Here, certainly, Hungary and Poland are good examples of that. What about Meloni in Italy, our newest uh, populist government? Well, I've just been in Rome talking to so-called populists on the left and on the right. So Meloni's people, uh, the League people, and also um, Five Star. And they all tell me, we're no longer populists. The five stars say we're progressives or maybe even moderates now. Um, and the League and uh, the Brothers of Italy say, no, 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 we're national conservatives. So big question, are they truly national conservatives? Only time will tell. That is what Hungary and Poland were. On the other hand, I talk to my mainstream friends in Rome as well and they say, no, 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 no. Maloney's got the message. And anyway, this is third generation. This is no longer fascist, post-fascist. It's ah fascist. It's not fascist. It's something else. But they still have the enemy, the left, just listening to the discourse. Okay, so that's what happens with populism. But populists. So what do you do? How do you overcome populist challenges? Well, do does the mainstream simply adopt? The style of discourse? No, disaster. The populists are much better at it, the um, sort of the demonizing and all of that than the mainstream. No, one has to avoid the us versus them populist style of discourse and have a more impassioned as opposed to polarizing discourse. And has, you, one has to challenge the lies, the bullshit with the truth. And of course, the content of the discourse is really important. There needs to be a more progressive vision. It's got to be inclusive. It needs to address the problems of, the ec ec of economics and social, cultural issues and the climate. I and mean, I think that there's really got to be a progressive message that comes out, but it can't just be words. It also has to be in deeds. Um, and the messenger, again, you need leaders with a progressive charisma, whatever that is. Um, we need to find that. Um, 
but also one needs to rebuild networks of parties and followers, needs to deep, you know, sort of drill, around, drill back down into the grassroots, you know, get back the ties to the national level. But this means a major reconstruction for parties uh, and certainly don't imitate the messages and style of content um, of the extremes on the right or the left but especially it's the center of the right that is actually the most dangerous here about being um, being pulled um, by the, the extreme right. And of course, change the algorithms, maybe regulate social media better, more on the media content, but also deal with the ownership. And finally, the milieu, you know, nothing's going to change unless the socioeconomics of discontent, the social cult, sociocultural worries about loss of status, and the political sources of dis discontent in terms of mainstream parties that don't listen, that aren't responsive, say we know better, um, including on issues of climate change. One needs to kind of address the problems that people have in their homes in their, you know, in their lives as well. So that's overcoming populist challenges, one. How, what does the EU do in this context? Here, so for policies, um, on the economics, one needs to actually rethink the neoliberal assumptions that are baked into the rules. Remember, since the 1980s, we've had conservative neoliberalism and social democratic neoliberalism, then the ramping up of neoliberalism with, um, with the eurozone crisis, et cetera. And in the beginning, you know, you, one can argue, I think, quite successfully that this was an important corrective. But by now, we've seen that neoliberalism has gone too far, simply by the kind of out, the, the sort of the uprising of or the increase in populism. We're in a very dangerous place today. So one needs to rethink the neoliberalism and first invest, you know, the fiscal rules. Read my book to see what I mean by this in terms of ending governing by rules and ruling by numbers, but better yet, read all of the policy reports that Zoe um, has been doing um, on all of this. I mean, it's tremendous work there. Um, but the, you know, and what we see, I, I find that the, the EU commission has been a bit disappointing on this. I understand the difficulty of, of saying, well, we're not going to do this anymore, given that there's it's it's baked into the law and the institutions, but this is taking us nowhere in terms of those fiscal rules, except maybe just ignoring them again. Um, new EU solidarity fund is tremendously important. Uh, you know, think about it as a response to the US. Um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, but it's also about how do we deal with these major challenges now in terms of climate change, also in in also in view of the Ukraine war. But there needs to be new industrial policy, new ideas about how to do it. And it's not just about climate change, it's also about digitalization and, of course, responding to addressing the social inequalities. Um, and I know that this is all in the plans of the commission, but you can't just say it, it needs to be done. Respond to these concerns about loss of status, et cetera. So there needs to be new social cohesion policy, build on what's been done actually during the COVID-19 crisis, but build in welfare. What about you know universal unemployment benefits? Deal with the gender issues, which are tremendously important, which have gotten ever since gender mainstreaming, have kind of been pushed to the side and forgotten. Um, and of course, youth unemployment and do something about immigration because this is just a, you know, this, this is, uh, this simply continues to make the extreme right really happy because until immigration is fixed, it's, you know, it's their calling card. And finally on the politics, democratize and decentralize the European semester. It's still, even though it's much more bottom up, it's actually, it's not the fault of the commission now, it's the fault of national capitals, but it tends to be highly centralized. This should be seen, you know, the European semester in particular on climate change, et cetera, don't make it appear as if it's centralized and technocratic. Send it back to the people. It may take longer, but at least you can also serve to revitalize democracy 
as you decentralize the decision making. And of course, bring citizens in back, back in more generally beyond, say, the Conference on the Future of Europe. And then, of course, procedures. I don't need to tell uh, all of you in the commission about this and the unanim unanimity rule, enforce the rule of law in terms of Poland and Hungary, because you don't want other countries to follow that path. Empower the European Parliament more than it is today. And of course, it's all about communication as well. Commu communicate more and better about vision and identity. And finally, in conclusion, we've got to ask the big questions. Is this a moment of great transformation? Are we moving to an illiberal paradigm? You know, just wait. I've been hearing this as well. Meloni is trying to get as head of the conservative uh, and reform group, uh, is trying to get the EPP to join into a big conservative coalition, as opposed to the kind of what I've been told is co seen as cohabitation between the EPP and the Social Democrats. Um, if that happens, there's a very good chance that there'll be a move to illiberal democracy. I think I exaggerate when I say authoritarianism, but as Dan Ziblatt and Stephen Levitsky wrote in their book, democracies die by elected populist leaders who subvert democratic processes that brought them to power. So is it an illiberal paradigm or perhaps a progressive liberal paradigm? Is that possible? Is that possible? And for this, we need new messages and better messengers, better use of media and a remedy of the milieu with a vision adapted to different levels of government. It can't just be coming from up here at the EU level or even from national capital. There needs to be bottom up uh, progressive visions dealing at all levels. And I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivian. Very interesting. And um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions and um, we've been collecting them while you were talking and Nadia will come up with some good questions, I guess. Nadia, did you have the chance yes. to look at the questions? Well, also from my, from my side, uh, thank you very much. Um, also for sharing um, all these transformative ideas. Uh, and I mean, this is also what, what this uh, session is about, to discuss the transformative ideas and discuss new ways forward. Um, so yes, we have received a few questions. Um, please feel free to, to, to add more. Um, there is still room because we have now 50 minutes to discuss. Um, so I think I'm just going to start with the with the first question that is also uh, voted voted first. Um, so I mean, you 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 also you also talked about about that a bit in your in your in your speech uh, or in your, in your presentation um, about the role of uh, neoliberal um, policies um, as well as austerity measures. And so here the question is, what is the role of failed um, neoclassic neoliberal economics as preparing the ground for populists. So for example, um, Macron from Le Pen, um, maybe also an important question in, in, in the context of what's going on in France at the moment with the, uh, with the pension reform, et cetera. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, I actually did a, an edited book in 2013 on resilient liberalism in Europe's political economy, where we had a number of people talking about the problems of neoliberalism basically haven't gone too far, or why was it so resilient? Um, mm. And resilience in terms of core ideas that keep coming back that seem to be mutable and adaptable, um, but also rhetoric versus reality, talk a good game, but actually don't deliver. And a, one thing that's interesting, and, and, and it, that's another form of resilience or better strength in debates than the opposition or the social democrats, um, but also it was in the interest of powerful interests. Um, and then once it's embedded in the institutions, it's very hard to get rid of. So this it is about the failure of neoclassical economics. It's about assumptions. Um, about sort of rational man models that, you know, make it really great for mathematical modeling but and parsimony, but they actually don't reflect 
real people's lives. And what you saw actually in, and, and what's interesting about this, there's this sort of the neoclassical economic theory that then is applied and applied again, but then is once put in practice, it's actually changed. I mean, even if you look at monetarism um, in, in the UK or supply side economics in the US, um, neoliberalism practice actually didn't apply, didn't succeed in applying those. Monetarism was a failure, so was supply side economics. It increased massively in unemployment. And what you saw very quickly is neo Keynesian solutions came back in, but no one said it. And so Thatcher and Reagan were be able to say, were able to say, see, we were successful and move on to privatization, et cetera, without ever challenging those rules. Now, I think it's important, and I'll end here, it's important to recognize that we're all neoliberals now. So this is not a question of going back to neo-Keynesianism a la 1930s or 40s or 50s or even 60s, but rather, where do we go from here? How do we build in um, resilience, if you will, of a more progressive kind, one where you can get people back, you can get people back from the extremes. And that's really, I think, actually the kind of, uh, the, the, the progressive policies that are proposed now in terms of addressing climate change and um, digitalization of the economy and addressing social equality, inequalities is really important. And that may be the answer, but it's not gonna be the answer if you still have Macron basically refusing on the democratic side to discuss. Let's talk about pension forms. That, you know, that gives everyone in France the view of someone who's a kind of authoritarian, I know better, I'm imposing. And that also looks a lot like neoliberalism where the assumption is we know better than, and the, and you can't trust the democrat, you, you can't trust the people, this is a true, this is at the basis of neoliberal philosophies, whether we talk about Milton Friedman or um, uh, Friedrich von Hayek, it's you can't trust the people and certainly you can't trust uh, those rent seeking public servants. You know, one needs to recognize that public servants can, can do good, um, that there is a role for government. It's about industrial policy. It's about investing in the future. And for too long, the assumption was the markets were going to solve all the problems. Well, they haven't. On the contrary, they made them worse and worse and worse. We've got financial capitalism now of a kind that goes from crisis to crisis. And every time we're bailing out the banks at the same time that they're, you know, the people and now the real people, the people who you know, are listening to the siren calls of populism because they find it hard to make ends meet. So there need to be solutions for the yellow vests. Yes, a carbon tax is a real problem for them because they couldn't even drive to their jobs. So there needs to be sort of a recognition that there's not one solution that there need, and that's why I was talking about decentralization down to the local level. And for France, it may very well be that you can't simply say retirement at 64. Although of course in the US where retirement at 67 or eight or nine and you know Italy at 67, but that's not the point. It's that the people, the people, but the unions, there is no dialogue, no significant dialogue and responsiveness. And that's the problem really. That it's not just that one has to respond to to go beyond neo you know, neoliberalism, but one also has to go beyond the kind of democratic uh, um, lack of democracy, increasing lack of democracy in terms of of responsiveness to the people, and 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 that you know that we've seen increasingly uh, over time, and in particular during the eurozone crisis. Mm -hmm in particular in those first years, in particular in Southern Europe, but I'll stop there. Um, yeah, thanks Thanks a lot. I mean, a very, very uh, comprehensive, uh, clear answer on that. Um, I mean, you, you, you talked a bit about um, um, yeah, the, the importance of, 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 uh, of, of democracy, of the importance of, of uh, parties really, um, um, yeah, pushing for, for democratic um, 
uh, yeah, not not push it, not going towards um, illiberal um, illiberal discourses. So there's also one question on why um, why then actually why then center parties are adopting these type of discourses um, when they know that this rather leads to more votes for extremists. Um, well, I mean, the big question is that center parties don't know that this is votes for extremists. What they're trying to do, I mean, it, on a very kind of interest-based political calculation, they're saying, oh my God, and here let's talk about center-right parties first, we're losing our electorate to these extremes. Well, they figure the only way we can deal with this is go with the extremes. But the extremes, this is Marine Le Pen, you know, saying to the center-right in France, you know, basically, this is just, you're just trying to copy me. Well, the original is always better than the copy. And what we've seen over and over again across Europe is that the center right has gotten smaller and smaller. Also because it's been chasing after the center, after the extreme right. But the center left has also been chasing after the center right that's been chasing after the extreme right in the sense that they've all been, you know, basically they're too much listening to the siren calls of the extremes uh, on the right in particular, um, because there's a sort of a concern on the center, the center left has been much more concerned for longer about, uh, about dealing with the extreme left. Although what we've seen is that the extreme left actually modifies much more its position toward the center when in government with, with the center left. The problem I think for, for everyone is that when you've got a certain set of, of economic policies that mean that the center right and the center left don't listen or have very little freedom of movement, no maneuver, then they're simply going to lose. And here um, they're gonna lose to the extreme left, but they're also gonna lose to the extreme right. And there, one can also talk about where you find more of the one or the other. And with the Eurozone crisis on, on in, in Northern Europe that was really not much affected by the crisis, it was very easy for the extreme right to say, you know, they're lazy, it's their fault, the South. Um, and it got, you know, you even got the extreme right in Germany, which everyone had said not possible with the <clears throat> AFD, but you got it across uh, across Northern Europe, whereas in Southern Europe, at first you got only the extreme left. <clears throat> then you also got the extreme right. You got Vox. So, and there's no guarantee um, of anything. And of course, in in France, you've got both. And in most countries now, you've got both the extremes on the left and the extremes on the right. Um, why can't the center right or left do something more? I think with the COVID response was the beginning of a solution. It was a recognition that actually, no, we have to do something. Um, the big question now is, is something gonna be done or not? Because we've now got, we're back into the same old problem that you got at the beginning of the Eurozone crisis between the frugals and the solidarity coalition and, um, and that's very, very short-sighted, very short-sighted. Um, what you're also seeing on the state aid debate is Germany and France say, you know, let us do what we want, but there the inequalities will rise. And when you've got inequalities, you get resentment. You get resentment between countries and you get resentment within countries. So, I mean, that's, I think the role for the EU really is to say, no, 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 if you want your state aid, we need to have a more general package. And this is why I put in that slide about we need an EU solidarity fund. Mm -hmm. I'm perfectly happy for the commission to engage in conditionality. That's fine as long as it's positive. But there, that's when we've got to start saying we need to rethink neoliberalism because they're built into neoliberalism and assumptions that the welfare state always creates laziness and dependency, can't have that, we need to cut, cut, cut. And there's a resistance to labor unions because you need to have the free market, you know, the markets as free as possible. Well, what people are beginning to see now is that unions are necessary also to speak for the people, to ensure that wages can increase. So the people actually have living wages. I mean, so there's a there's there, there are deep connections between 
all of this, which means that until center-right and center-left parties recognize, and most have, it seems to me, to more or less, that you need this new kind of vision of where we're going, a more progressive vision, and populism is going to continue to flourish because um, it is attractive in some sense. You know, it's let's all, you know, go back to our nations. Let's mm. get rid of immigrants. I mean, it, it see, but of course it's a disaster for the, for the country, for Europe, for the world. But unfortunately we've seen what happened in the past in the thirties. Um, we certainly want to avoid that. And I think we're at, you know, we're, we're, we're at a cusp. We can go one way or another. Yeah, and also in times of transformation, when, when you certainly have lots of fears floating around, people are not sure what's going to happen, how can we adopt? And I think it, it goes for the same here, right? I mean, the fear of losing the car or the fear of having to heat differently or whatsoever. And what I find very shocking here, especially in Germany currently, I'm not sure how the debate goes in other countries, but you have the liberals and the, the social democrats basically working together on not delivering solutions, but rather playing the trumpet of populism and, 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 and avoiding clear guidance or avoiding talking about what's at stake. And, and I think that's very dangerous and, 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 and frustrating at the same time to have them. And, and this is where I think this question that, that came here is about the, the motivation. It's very interesting to see that it can be a very different motivation, right? It can be fed by fear of migrants, but it can also be fed by fear of changing the traditional way of doing business. It can be fed by the fear of change towards something new or whatsoever. There are different sources, sources it looks like. And when it comes to, to, yeah, to this. But now we have only zero minutes left to, to yeah. answer all these questions. And maybe before we leave here, I leave it to you. There's one question. Are you going to the Beyond Growth Conference? And uh, maybe you can include some wrap up of the discussion here. Uh, to close the event. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, am I going to the Beyond Growth? I haven't decided. I'm not sure yet, but um, I'd love to. Um, but I think, I think basically, I think Christoph, you said it all. I mean, basically, we are at this this very dangerous moment. Germany, in particular, has been incredibly disappointing. Mm. Um, It, when when Schultz came in, everyone thought, oh, now finally Macron and Schultz, they'll really solve this problem. And yet Germany seems to be holding everyone back. And it seems a kind of nationalism. Um, and I think it's probably the nature of the coalition, but this is politics. And I think we are in a dangerous moment because the EU balance can change. And if you move back, people are angry and resentful. And this is being fueled by a populist discourse. But even if you didn't have that populist discourse, you would have that the, the discontent because those sources of his discontent run deep. So the question mm. is, how can one avoid this exploding in some, into something really nasty? Um, and or better yet, or just or 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 maybe that the EU will ultimately drift, that it will be this kind of Uh, tourism uh, medieval play park for tourists from China or tourists from the U.S. as emerging powers balance against the great power. Here we're getting into, inter in, you know, ba basically geopolitics and all of that. But basically, if the EU doesn't work together on a progressive agenda, it's, yeah. going, to, it's going to fall apart or it's going to be just this you know, some nothing that doesn't solve it problems as the U.S. does, as and China will. So mm. that's really a big challenge. And I don't think the populists are thinking, because the populists don't think strategically at the EU level. They're thinking primarily at the national mm. level. And this goes for the, 
for the left, the extreme left, as much as the right, because there's a certain element of sovereignism here as yeah. well. Thanks a lot, Vivian, for a lot of food for thought and, and to continue here. And um, thanks for everybody yeah, for being here and um, to Frank Simon Thomas and his team for this great initiative. Thanks to our team who's working in the background. And we hope to see you at the next event. It's about home ownership. And um, Sebastian Cole, Professor Sebastian Cole, is certainly very interesting to listen to, I'm sure. And we will share the recording and the PowerPoint with you. And Vivian, thanks again. And thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thanks, Nadia. Thanks a lot for the discussion. Thanks for our questions. Yep. Bye. Bye.